I am Beth and I have a question for you. Do you and your partner feel more like roommates than you do spouses? Can you relate? So in the evenings you find yourself scrolling through social media versus taking time to connect or maybe you find that you're just too busy with kids, with careers that you just don't make time for each other. Well, I'm Beth Miller. I am a marriage coach and I help women save their marriages and I have my incredible guest coming on, Lindsay. She and Lindsay is a mom of two boys. She's a wife. She's a podcaster of the Easy Living Podcast, and she'll be joining us shortly. She speaks what I love about her. Lindsay, hey. Hi. I'll just finish introducing you. I am yeah. great. And she's just awesome. As you will know in a few minutes, she speaks vulnerably, vulnerably about her relationships, her faith, and just those real life hard issues. She shares her hope, her laughter, and her practical wisdom with all those who follow her. So she launched The Wife Project in 2021, which moves you from the roommate zone into soulmate zone. So Lindsay, I'm so excited to have you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's so, my little yes. stand, I can't find it. So I'm sorry. I'm like falling over. <laughs> you know, if only people could see the behind the scenes when we're trying to like yeah. set up. I'm in my son's yeah. room. Like I have a bunk bed beside me right now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's real life. Just Let me try to end up. I'm going to try to set my thing up a little bit better. How's your day going? Well, it's been going well. It's beautiful. I'm in Canada, and it's nice and, like, warm today. Like, the sun's out, and it's really nice. So oh, cool. I'm excited to jump into this topic with you. So yeah. we're going to talk about all things how to make your marriage fun again when we're really moving out of that roommate zone into soulmate zone or getting you moving in that direction. So I'd love for you to share some of your great tips with us. So let's start with this process. So... I think most of us know if you're in the roommate zone, like there's not a lot of intimacy, physical, emotional intimacy happening, not a lot of connection. You're probably more talking about the to do things like who's getting the kids here, there, who's grabbing groceries, yeah. who's paying bills, the to do things in the house. So how, how do we start to move ourselves out of that zone? What are some of the strategies we need to start using? Um, one of the biggest things that I think I have realized, I guess one of the first steps is just being hyper aware of the conversations that you're having when you're dating or when you're even sitting down for a meal or taking a walk because they so quickly can veer toward children or work. And my husband and I just have a rule that that is not something that we will communicate about um, when we are having date time. I'm going to try to brighten myself a little bit. Um, when we are having date time and or even just alone time, we want we set aside intentional time. We call them like our meeting nights where we sit down and talk about finances, about our children and kind of the growth patterns that we're seeing. We talk about our businesses, but when we are dating or trying to pursue one another or when we're in the bedroom, like those are not topics of conversation essentially. So I think that's one of the biggest parts because when you become roommates, everything becomes cut and dry, relational um, in the sense that you're, more friends or just more like business partners and that's just not a way to live within your relationship so I'll say that's key number one number two is spontaneity I am really big on being spontaneous I actually recently just planned a week-long vacation for my husband that I told him about four days before we left and it was to Universal Studios in Florida and I, we were getting in this rut of feeling like, oh my gosh, we're just kind of going through the motions, but also we've been so busy and had so much going on. We need a breather. And so we took that little trip and it was so beneficial while like the process of getting there was like, oh my gosh, it was this crazy decision. It was so good for us to just have that one-on-one -on -one time. Because like you said, when we're worried about getting the kids here and there, or when we're you know, just focus so heavily on the actual um, job of being a parent or of being a business person, you really lose sight of one another. And sometimes we have moments where we've gone the whole entire day without connecting at all. We'll be together all day, but then by the end of it, I'm like, I wrote this, <coughs> sorry, and I've had to leave my throat all day. Um, I wrote something in a post recently where I said, it, it, we'll go to the zoo and have to be with the kids and like have a great day. But at the end, I'm like, hi, like, how are you? And it's like, hey, how are you? And I'm like, yeah, we haven't, like, actually physically connected at all today or even emotionally. So oh, I think I those it. are two really important things is to separate your time so you're talking about things that matter. And we can talk about what that can look like if you don't know how to do that. 
but then also being spontaneous, being adventurous, and finding moments for connection. I like that. So what are your suggestions? If we can't talk about kids, we can't talk about work, what are we going to talk about? Like, do you research topics beforehand? What would you suggest to those? I mainly work with wives, but what would you suggest to those wives that are like, I, I don't have much going on. I, I work from home. I interact with my computer and the odd Zoom call. There's yeah. not much exciting happening in my life. Yes. I don't really care about politics. What do I do? What do I talk about? I really want to have deeper conversations. Where do you go from there? Yes. Well, I work primarily with wives as well. I created um, an eight-week biblical study called The Wife Project from Roommates to Soulmates. And it is, um, has been purchased and has changed marriages around almost in almost every country in the world. And it's linked in my bio as well. And in The Wife Project, I do share um, a set of questions that are basically bids for attention. So what this is, and the Gottman Institute talks about this pretty heavily, but these bids for attention are all essentially something to, to let your spouse know, hey, I'm longing for your attention and I kind of need you to give that back to me. So sometimes this can be something as simple as, do you love me? These, these are the smaller bids. Like, do you love me? Yes, of course I love you. You know, um, or do you see me or are you my best friend? Or like those little things. But then you get into the bigger bids where you start asking questions that help your spouse to see you more clearly or help you to see your spouse more clearly. And that's what I've written through in the wife project. But a few of those, and Jesse and I do this really often. I mean, at least once a month, um, and on dates almost always. And it feels sometimes like it can absolutely feel redundant in the questioning, but the answers are always different. So for example, one of the questions I'll ask him is, what are three ways that I've loved you really well this month? And then he can answer. And then I'll say, what are three ways that I could have served you better this month? Now, granted, you have to have an open heart. You have to be willing to go into this with a willingness to receive their answer. I don't ever respond anything in defense. I just hear him and what he is feeling. Um, I'll ask about intimacy. What are two ways that I could spice up our sex life that you would like or two things you've been thinking about lately intimately, intimacy wise? Um, and so it, it, there's, uh, there's plenty of those types of questions that you can a ask. And then sometimes it will come with a, you know, I think this has been really sweet in our marriage this month. Like, I think this has been something that's really beneficial and it stems an entire conversation where we're talking the whole night because I have been, I'm like, oh, you know what? This is what God has been teaching my heart and what I'm growing in. And that's probably why you're seeing the fruit of this. Or, yeah, you're totally seeing me like slacking there or not loving you well there. Here's why. Here's what's going on in my life. And my husband does the same. So I feel like the more comfortable, like, of course, it's awkward at first and it can be weird, but the more comfortable you get with putting those bids out there and putting those questions out there, the more fruit that you see within the relationship and within the conversations. I think that's absolutely beautiful. What a great way to practice together too, because it's not always natural to be able to have those deeper conversations where you actually talk about feelings. Yeah. So many of us grow up in families where you don't really talk about feelings. You just like, you feel mad. Well, you know what? You got to get over it. That's just the way life is. Or you know what? Things are going the way you want. Well, just kind of suck it up or stop crying. Like just move on. So I think if you can start building that with your partner, where you start talking about how you feel and that you're doing it in a way that isn't triggering each other, where it feels mm -hmm. safe, where you can be open and don't feel judged, but it takes some practice because you may never have had to be open like that and be vulnerable, which can feel scary for a lot of couples to, you know, really open your heart because in the past, maybe you've opened your heart to try to tell someone that your needs aren't being met and it's just been squashed. And so mm -hmm. some couples, they have like little walls around their heart where they don't always want to let their other partner in fully. So yeah. I think this is a great practice to start that because like you said, the more you start it, the more fruit will grow. I think that's such a beautiful way of putting it. Mm -hmm. Well, and also in, in having the awareness that going into the conversation, I think it's very important to be sure, as you're saying, that it is a safe place going into the conversation. Obviously, if you have someone who never receives even the smallest bids, like if you say, do you love me? And they're like, stop, you're being ridiculous. Obviously, they've not created a safe place. And that's where I always recommend marriage counseling or accountability or somebody to come into the relationship. But if you have a spouse who receives, you just want to make sure you're in a good place within your relationship to have those conversations. You don't want it coming off the tail end of a fight. Um, Sometimes getting that out of the house for a date can be stressful. So you don't want that to be 
one of the situations where you're like stressed out and then you're like, okay, what are three things I've done <laughs> that have made you mad this week? Because obviously that's not going to bear fruit. You want to go into it with the purpose of, hey, I'm going to ask you this question and have this date night and we're going to have fun. But also I want to ask these things. And, and that's the thing is it doesn't have to be heavy. Like sometimes it will be, but we have such a blast on our dates. Like we will just go out, we people watch, we, and I have a lot of fun date ideas as well in the wife project, but we'll do things like restaurant hopping where we go one place for an appetizer, one for an entree, one for dessert. And it just, it creates conversation. It, it's fun. Like we enjoy doing it. And in the interim, we'll kind of ask those questions. And a lot of the time the answers will make us laugh. Like we have humor. It doesn't have to be so heavy. But we always, and I, I don't say this lightly, like I really believe we always come out of a date closer than we were before. We always come out of a date feeling connected. And granted, there's moments where it just <clears throat> doesn't do what we hoped that it would do. But we make sure by the end of the night before we go to sleep, if dinner wasn't a success, that we find a place of connection together, whether that's physical or emotional. Um, and also going out with other couples can be really, really beneficial. We love going out with other couples because it draws out different, unique conversation to where you're not feeling um, maybe like you're repeating yourself over and over again with your spouse or, or like you've already had these conversations throughout the day. You're getting to know other people. And then it also gives you conversation for when you get home. Yeah, I think that's great. I do know some couples, and I'll just play the devil's advocate to this piece, when they, they only go on date nights with other couples because they almost mm -hmm. feel like they just don't know what to say to each other. Like they just, they're not connecting on those deeper levels before they even go on the date. So like they don't have the skills anymore per se to when they go and have to be alone for like two hours and have <laughs> dinner together that it's just really awkward. Like there's nothing to talk about because they haven't, it's almost like you have to build up to go on a date to spend two hours together with each other. If you're in a point where you've shut down so much that you really are just roommates, would yeah. you like to speak to that? Yeah. Yes. I think couple date nights, friend date nights, group dates should be the exception, not the rule. The rule is together and alone. Um, I think even it can be the tendency of couples to take their kids with them. And that's not a date. It's just granted, not everybody has a village, but that date can be when the kids are asleep and you make a fun fort and you make popcorn and chocolate. That's our thing. Popcorn and chocolate, or just like do a fondue board or something fun that feels intentional. Um, I think that that's really good to speak to the couples who feel like, Oh my gosh, Lindsay, I don't even know where I would begin. One, the wife project will help you with those ideas, but two, there's also the, um, and I talk about this pretty heavily on the living easy podcast as well, but the face to face dates and then the side by side. So women tend to bond best having communication like you and I are Beth, like just we're talking, we're getting to know each other, we're communicating. And then side by side for men tends to be the way they bond. So for my husband, like playing video games with some headphones on his ears while talking to his friends is his thing or playing ping pong in the garage. Like they do that all the time or playing cornhole, like these activities where they're able to still communicate, but it's not this forced communication. It's very healthy. It doesn't need to be deep and intense. It can just be fun. So I encourage women and wives and men to blend these two on a date. So what this can look like is you go and um, you do your side-by-side -side date first. This loosens things up. It creates fun. If you're not uber competitive, this is helpful. You can go to um, a board game cafe. They do those things. We have a blast. Like we laugh so hard when we go to those cafes because we play like headbands or whatever it might be. But then you can also have a drink or coffee or food. Um, you can go and do axe throwing. You can go to put to top golf. You can, I mean, there's so many side by side things that you do or just going golfing. I like to drive the cart. I don't golf, but my husband does. And we still do that side by side. And then after that, we'll go to a coffee shop or we'll go to dinner where we're then face to face. And then we have those conversations that are essentially intentional and more deep, but you also come riding off the coattails of the side by side date where it loosened both of you. You had fun, maybe you had a drink and you just can enjoy one another a little bit more rather than feeling like you're walking into something that's awkward for you. Um, thank you, Carrie. That's very sweet. But I, I feel that it has to be built. It has to be grown. And it isn't always something that's going to come easily, especially if it's not something that you're used to and dating your spouse and being intentional and 
having hard, deep conversations. Um, but I truly, genuinely, with all my heart, believe that the relationship, the fun, the joy, the friendship comes, at least I can speak for myself, comes from my, the depth of how I know Jesse, my husband, the depth of how, of our, our closeness, of our, the tight knit relationship that we have because of those hard conversations that we then just trust one another physically and emotionally. We're vulnerable with one another. Um, we're not afraid to lay it all out on the table in any sense because we have that relationship and that freedom in any marriage is going to bring joy and is going to bring a healthy marriage versus one of roommates. Yeah. Let's talk about timelines with all this. Like in your work, how often should couples be going on dates? And like, I know it's based on budget a lot of time, but like you said, you can just build a fort at home, like just be kids and laugh and have popcorn and just be silly, right? Like just yeah. bring out that inner child within you um, that doesn't have all these responsibilities and kind of like heaviness that needs to come yeah. to the relationship. That's just like being a couple, not being like managers of a household. How often should we be having these dates to reconnect, whether it's like a five minute session or it's an hour or it's a full day or it's a one week? Like what are your thoughts on all like in time and how often? Sure. So I, in regards to how often and having the dates, I'll answer that first. I would say at least twice a month. I am really big on weekly dates, but I also know for some families with newborn babies or who have special needs children at home, that's not always as easy. Or if you don't have a village, that makes a huge difference. So um, I would say at least bi-weekly. Again, if that means going to a coffee shop while your baby is napping in the carrier, if that's all that you can do, do that. Your marriage, um, I actually recently just wrote about this on my reels, but your marriage, a healthy marriage pours into a healthy home and a healthy family life. If you are putting your children or your babies before your marriage, one, your babies are going to eventually leave one day, but two, that dissension, the discord, or even just the numbness between you and your spouse eventually can lead to that within your children and the way they communicate, the way they connect with their future spouses your marriage creates a healthy home. So if you're like, oh, there's no way, my kids are too busy, I have too much going on, I can't do two weeks, two dates a month or three or four dates a month, I would just say check in, in love, I say check your priorities, check where your heart is. If your children are being placed above your spouse, there may be some discord there that's causing division within your marriage that may be making you feel like your roommates. Um, but I think anything counts, honestly. Like, I genuinely believe sometimes we connect more on a seven-minute walk than we do on a two-hour dinner date. It just depends on where we're feeling and how we're talking. And being outside, I think, is very powerful and very... My, I have a timer on my... Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. You're back. I have a timer on my phone for Instagram and it paused me but now I can't see you you know you pick, pick you fiddle with that I'll mention something in regards to what you said okay go ahead I think it's so important when you're saying you're too busy to have a date night or like you said a seven minute walk or a dinner with your partner a lot of times that word I'm too busy the word busy means I have other things that more are more of a priority. My yes. kids are more of a priority. My career is more of a priority. So I think it's the wording. What does busy mean to you? And what are you communicating to your partner by saying, I think we're just too busy. You're mm -hmm. saying that you're not putting your marriage. Look at you go. You're not putting your marriage in the spotlight, right? And it doesn't have to be a spotlight. You can have multiple pots on a stove, but sometimes when we're so busy, we can't keep all four pots on the stove. Sometimes we have to take one off. So if that's, yeah. <laughs> where are you now? It's good. It won't let me come back. <laughs> oh it just, it's just it's showing, it's showing me your screen. But okay, well, you're still here. I see a desk <laughs> with a lamp. <laughs> this is what I can see. I wonder, let's see. Well, I'll just keep going here. All right, so anyone's watching, we have some technical difficulties on Lindsay's end. If you have any questions, pop them in the chat. Right now we're answering anyone's questions around how to move from the roommate zone into the soulmate zone, how to go from a place of lack of intimacy into a place of like you're enjoying each other's company again. 
whether, oh, we completely lost her. So she will hopefully request to join in a second. All right. Oh, she's coming back. Here we go. All right, Lindsay, we'll get back to our conversation about making your spouse a priority, making your marriage a priority. Lindsay, you're back. Well done. I'm you back. navigated that tech bump. <laughs> yes, I'm so sorry. I, I, I have boundaries, which is good on my Instagram. It shuts me down, <laughs> but then it just messes up. Sorry. Oh, that's awesome. Well, that's good. So, you know what? We were just chatting there about making it a priority, right? And I was just talking about sometimes we have so much going on in life. Like if life is the stove, you have four pots on and things are starting to boil over. We got to take one off and somehow that's got to happen so that you can make your marriage a priority too. So your, your marriage is one of those pots and you can't let that one boil over. Cause like you said, one day you will, your kids won't be there. And what are you guys going to be together? You won't be much. You'll just be kind of like shells of human beings living together yeah. because you haven't created that connection. So and such mm -hmm. joy, there's such joy in having a partner. That's why you dated them, right? Like you dated mm -hmm. your partner and it was a lot of fun. So you can bring that fun back. So let me tell me some of the, like some of the best ideas, like maybe out of the box ideas for having date nights. Oh my gosh. Um, I'm an adventurer. So I think that a lot of couples can maybe be creatures of habit. So they tend to do a lot of similar things every single time. And so that would probably be my big, biggest piece of advice is do something different. Like be intentional about doing something different fine. I mean, we literally have unlimited resources when it comes to figuring out the things that there are to do around our city, um, your city and fun events. And it might not always be your cup of tea. So things that we like to do are, um, one, I will say my best tip, my best, if you can, is do not do a date night, do a date day. There's so many reasons for this, but especially as a mama, I am zonked by 6 p.m. Like, I'm done, I'm touched out, I'm emotionally tapped out. But when I wake up and I have a sitter come at 10.30 and we go out for brunch and we go to, we're near Nashville, like we go to Nashville for the day or we go to a park and have a picnic, we are so much more emotionally available to one another because we're not exhausted. And it also opens up the opportunity for places and things to do. Because at nighttime, it's like, Okay, dinner, movie, coffee, like that's kind of all that there is. But if you're doing morning date days, it gives you just chances to be outside. Um, we love to do things like marketplaces. So we'll go to Saturday marketplaces. We will go and do brunch on the patio. We go to like things like escape room, which is indoors. Like I mentioned, board game cafes. Um, one of the best things that we have done is we created a little mason jar with wooden sticks, like popsicle sticks. And we wrote down about 50 different ideas. We actually have two mason jars. So one is for um, like outdoor activities. One is indoor paid activities, just so that we know what we're getting into. And we will pull out one of the popsicle sticks. And the rule of thumb is you cannot change it. Like you have to go with it. So some days it's like, let's go kayaking on the river. And it's the last thing that we want to do that day is kayak on the river. But as long as it's weather, like it, it works with the weather, we force ourselves to go. And we always, always, always end up feeling so much better about going and just getting it done. Like not getting it done, but doing it and forcing ourselves outside of our comfort zone sometimes. Um, but it, it just helps you to get out of that funk when you're like, okay, pick a stick. And we just got ideas. I have a ton of them on the Wife Project course, but then also Pinterest has a bunch of ideas so we do things like that, and um, I'm really big. Like, I plan far in advance for dates. I am definitely more of the planner. I stopped blaming my husband for not being a great planner long ago. He, he thinks of it. He'll plan a sitter for us, but he's, I have, I'm more adventurous, and I guess. So I tend to plan the ideas for what we do. And I'll plan in advance. Like, okay, um, this far out, we're going to get a paddle boat and we'll go on the water or this far out, we're going to go on a hike and here's where we're going to go. Or, um, we, I'm going to rent some rollerblades and we're going to rollerblade the neighborhood for the day or they're just fun, different things that takes planning and thought. And honestly, the more that when he does plan for a date and when I plan for a date, it helps us to feel like. I think closer to our spouse because we're considering them. We're considering their likes and dislikes, whether that's going to a football game or a soccer game or golfing. 
not something I would normally choose for myself, but I do it for him. And it really, even before the date, helps you to feel bonded to them. So yeah, I guess I would say those are some of my ideas. Those are great ideas. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's really important too that you mentioned that you take the lead on a lot of this. And some women would be like, I just want them to plan. I want them to initiate. But I think we have to meet our partners where they are. Sometimes that's just not their wheelhouse or they have their reasons why they feel like they don't want to plan because they're like, oh, I'm just not good at it. I don't have any ideas. I might make, I might get it wrong. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that you can take that lead, but then kind of nurture that fear in them, whether it's like, I'm going to get it wrong. Like, no, here you try. And I promise yeah. that we'll have fun kind of thing. So um, I think it's really important not to be triggered by your partner in regards to hearing them say, I don't want to plan it. It doesn't mean they don't love you. Just yes. seeing them, seeing them as to why, why are they not interested in planning and honoring them for that and asking, is that something you want to get better at? Or is it something that you're ever interested in? Or mm -hmm. it would mean a lot to me if you planned one spontaneous one. So communicating your needs in such a kind and loving way instead of taking it as like, they don't love me. They don't want to go on a date with me. Yeah. So I think well, that's really important. Yeah. And I agree. And I think that there's also a place of resentment that can build when you have this expectation of them, especially if somebody like my husband was not raised around that. Like that was not something that he saw often. Um, it was something that I saw much more often. And so, but I also just have much more of an extroverted personality. So I talked so much in the wife project though, about the strengths and weaknesses and balancing those in one another, rather than despising the weaknesses in the other person you use your strengths to balance and to work through their weak, work toward their weaknesses and, and to essentially love them well in their weakness rather than putting them down or condemning them for their weakness. So I think something like that with Jesse, I did, I had resentment toward him in the first, well, the first few years he was more romantic and intentional, but it actually, he was honest with me. And one day I was like, why don't you do that anymore? Like you do you used to do that so much. And he said, well, <laughs> I love you, but every time I plan something, you're like, oh, that's a really great idea, but what if we just did this instead? And I didn't even realize I was doing that and until he told me. And so it was really helpful to me, and it's given him more freedom where I just said, I didn't even realize that, and I wasn't trying to put your idea down. I was probably just being Lindsay and presenting my ideas, but not everything I think needs to be said out loud. And so... I've learned that and it's definitely prompted him to feel more comfortable and even like safe to plan a date to where he doesn't feel like I'm overruling him. Um, so yeah, I think that that is something that's important. It's balancing weaknesses. It's knowing that if it's not his thing, that's not something you need to be resentful or bitter toward. It's just a kind of a way of life and you balance and compromise together in a way that brings health instead of division. Yeah. I like how you worded that you're loving them in their weakness and that's it. Like love Gratitude are the highest vibrations we can have. And so if you're loving them in their weakness, you're not blaming them, you're not putting them down. I think that's really a beautiful way to put it. Yeah. So Lindsay, we had this question that popped up a little while ago. So hopefully she's still here. I'm struggling with developing emotional intimacy with my partner who struggles to be vulnerable. And this is such a common problem that I see even in my practice as well, that often the wife and the husband's ability to divulge vulnerability isn't always the same. Often I find the wives wanting to share more, but their husbands are shut off. And I think it's really important, kind of like the advice you just gave, love them in their weakness. So not feeling shut out, but understanding why they maybe have that little extra wall around their heart or why they don't feel comfortable opening their heart, whether they were never really taught how to do that in childhood or whether they've been hurt in the past and they're still holding on a bit of a wound there, just keeping their heart close to them with that wall. And maybe you can help foster that within them to help them break down that wall. Um, what would you like to add to that? Yeah, I think, um, honestly, I think that there is a lot that can be said for one, accepting the boundaries that they have for themselves while also living as an example to them with through vulnerability so that they're able to see that it is a safe place. I've spoken with many couples where the husband feels very confused about the state of the relationship and why the wife is only going to friends to talk about her issues. And it usually comes down to the fact that the husband hasn't and husband or wife in this situation hasn't created a safe space for the conversation. So if your spouse comes home and say they're, um, this is just an example, but overcompensating for trust and they're wanting to make sure you're, that they're being honest with you and they say, hey, I just wanted you to know I saw a pretty girl today. 
Um, she said, hello. I told her I was married. I just needed to let you know, get that off my chest. And you respond with, well, what else did you say? What, what, what did she look like? And da, 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 you know, and you start this questioning. You are immediately telling them, don't come to me and confide in me again. If they yeah, come subconsciously. to subconsciously without yeah. words, you're saying that, right? Your yes. energy is communicating that. Yes. And if they come to you and they say, Hey, I feel like the way that you handled the kids with me today, like was really divisive or I didn't feel as if it was helpful to the situation and you respond yelling or in anger or by shutting down and freezing them out, you are essentially then telling them, do not come and be vulnerable with me in this space. So I think that those are things to be fully aware of is how do you respond to the day to day? How do you respond to those little things in the relationship that, that allow them to um, kind of build those building blocks of trust and of vulnerability? I think counseling, I've mentioned it before. I'm huge on counseling. I am a um, firm believer I'm in the Bible. We talk, that's what my focus is. And I believe there's so much restoration and hope in reading that and in um, just having that stored in your heart, God's word stored in your heart. So for me, I think those things can make a really big difference in the way that we approach one another, the way that we heal in our relationships and the way that we even allow other people into our marriage because one of the best things that Jesse and I did uh, ever and have ever done for our marriage is letting other people in and being kind of just this open door when we sit down with friends and family obviously we have certain boundaries but there's also a place of just like hey here's what's going on in our lives we'd love for you guys to speak into it we're really struggling here or we're really struggling here we don't have secrets we don't hide because we know everyone goes through it um, if you listen to the Living Easy podcast, you'll hear the amount that I talk about my own struggles in my own marriage and what God has taught me and what growth I've had in my own. So I think that it, it's allowing yourself to not fear people's opinions of you, their responses to your marriage, and instead giving yourself the freedom to communicate the things that you have, that you do struggle with. And, and even if your spouse doesn't feel fully comfortable with it, you can share your own things which will, I believe, ultimately allow them to feel more comfortability to share with others and then allow other people to speak into your life who have honestly most of the time walked through the same thing that you're walking through. Yeah, absolutely. I like that part. You're sharing your story. You're not sharing mm -hmm. their story. And as a wife coach, I'm always sharing my story. And often if there's my own lessons in it, like if my husband, oh, I'm just trying to think an example. Like he'll say this. He's like, that's old Beth coming out versus – like if I if all of a sudden I'm tired and I'm a bit cranky or I'm a bit snappy or I'm yeah. a bit judgmental, he's like, that's old Beth. And I'm like, you're right. Like he outs yeah. me and I'm okay with that. I don't take that personally anymore because I'm like, thank you for that little check. Yeah. And I got to share my story all the time, but I don't share his opinion. I don't have that permission. Yeah. One other piece I like how, like I talked a tiny bit about maybe someone's heart is closed a little bit. Like they're not having that emotional vulnerability because their heart's closed maybe from role modeling as a child. But I like how you brought up the day to day. What are you doing day to day? And there's a cycle I like to talk about. It's called resistance. When you, when your partner's asking for something like I need, I need more love. I, I need you to spend more time with me. I need you to help me with putting the kids to bed mm -hmm. um, or initiate that. Um, when someone's asking, a partner's asking for a bit more help, but you, it's met with resistance. Like it's not met with a, yes, I'll help you. Over time, that resistance turns into resentment. Mm -hmm. And that resentment is that layering up of the anger, the bitterness, the frustration, the sadness. Mm -hmm. And by the time resentments happen enough, you just get to rejection. The rejection is when you start to close off that heart. So I think it's really important to notice the steps along the way, because that doesn't happen like overnight. This is like a slow process of constantly feeling like you're not being heard or not being understood with the resistance mm -hmm. to then feeling resentment like what's the point then that's when the love starts to get blocked because you're like yeah. I'm not going to let them in and then rejection like really I, I don't know if I'm there anymore and you have to really start to rebuild at that point so but you can get back when you get to rejection you could totally get back to the beginning yeah. um, if you have if you're ready for that yeah 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 I think that a hard heart is the biggest cause of divorce and no matter what no matter what i think it is it is the hardness as you're saying it's those little things and i have a full session on the wife project that talks about um the little foxes in your marriage and it's ultimately those little things that build up it's not always those big downfalls that cause the divorce 
It's the small, if only you would have done this, if only he would have done this, if only he would be better about unloading the dishwasher, if only she would treat me this way or greet me or be more sexual with me. Or, and, and as those things progress, as you're saying, you, I believe, I think that so much, as you're saying, I agree with you, but I also think that the resistance and the resentment really can be just fully intertwined and then based off of one another because I notice in my heart, say I've been building up this resentment and Jesse will make a bid toward me, whether it's physical or emotional and he'll like reach out to me and want to hug me. I, I may not communicate why I'm resentful, but I will resist and I'll withhold my love from him in that moment. And then he feels it and then he'll respond likely with resentment or with confusion. Cycle. And then it's this massive cycle. And I, I actually had this conversation in my head the other day where I was thinking, there are so many moments when we think that hard heartedness and withholding are the answer. I mean, almost always, if we don't choose to forgive, if we don't choose to love, if we don't choose to be intimate, if we don't choose to show that emotional vulnerability, we are allowing the hard heartedness to withdraw us. And then we're withholding that from the person that we love and the person that we want this relationship to thrive with. And yet we are allowing ourselves to stay stuck in that place without growth, without maturing. And then the division is created within the relationship. So I think that in pursuing, you know, the fun and the joy and that it, a lot of the time it means giving of yourself completely. It means choosing forgiveness because you have been forgiven of so much. I know I, in my life, I see myself as the most broken of them all, you know, and I have been forgiven by a great God and, and I have to then, I get to then, sometimes I don't want to, but I get to then pour that out onto the people in my own life because I have been forgiven so much. Who am I to withhold this from the people? I have been so deeply loved. Who am I to withhold this from my family? And, and being aware and intentional of those things and, and praying for me, like I need to get on my knees some days and pray for a healed heart because I am hardened and I'm bitter and I'm angry about something that may have happened and I don't want to move forward. But in those moments where I recognize that I don't want to get better or when I recognize that I don't want to move forward is when I genuinely feel like I start to separate in my marriage more than ever before. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. I think we should end it there. I love the way like really a good way to do a lot of this healing within your marriage is to bring the fun back. Do some yeah. of that inner work on yourself. Get curious about why you're feeling these anger, sadness, bitterness, why that's coming up and figuring mm -hmm. out how to forgive or to let go or to open your heart to more love um, while infusing some fun in there with date nights yeah. so that you can really create that intimacy. So there's a lot of little moving parts to this, but like, it's all doable. No matter where you are at in your marriage, you can get back to that place. I truly, truly believe that. If it's meant to be, it's you're, you're meant to be there for sure. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, Lindsay, thank you so much. Thank you for it. Did it again? Yes. Um, you could have just. Again? Yes. <laughs> it did it again. How can people find you? Yeah. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Living Easy with Lindsay. That is my marriage um, faith focus. I also have the Living Easy podcast. And I talk about marriage, sex, faith, relationships, motherhood, all kinds of things with vulnerability and openness. Um, and then the Wife Project course from roommates to soulmates. And then I also have business courses and social media courses as well. You do it all, Lindsay. That's for sure. <laughs> and any of your viewers that are checking me out for the first time, I'm Beth Miller. I am a marriage coach and I own a soul by wellness. And I have a 12-week program that gets women from who are on the verge of divorce in a place where they can have a thriving marriage. So mm -hmm. I have a great guide called three ways, three proven ways to save your marriage and you can get it in my bio. So Lindsay, this was awesome. so much fun. We must do this again. Yes. Thank you for having me. Sorry for my video issues. <laughs> <laughs> all good. I love, I, honestly, it's so, I love this. It's all good. So it's real. it kind of makes, yeah, it just makes it so real, right? Like it's not polished. It's yeah. <laughs> not perfect. It's what it is. So, all right, Lindsay, I'm going to let you go, but I will see you later. And everyone, thank you for watching. Yes, thank you. All right. Bye, Beth. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye.